We've all seen them, black creatures flying around the dusk. Occasionally, you can hear a high-pitched squeaking as they fly. But how do bats do this when it's so difficult to see? We're going to look at how bats have some pretty amazing abilities that allow them to see using sound. To do this, we have fantastic hearing, they have fantastic hearing and a much larger range of sounds than we do. However, we have similar abilities that we can use at a very low level. So we're going to see if we can use these sounds to give it an idea. Simon Kutayer is the director of Greenhouse, a local environmental organization that does conservation research on animal and plants. Dickon Cooper is a musician who plays the double bass and writes music. So tell us more about Bats Do Jazz. So, um, so essentially, the, what we wanted to achieve, what we wanted to do was um, to find a way on how to use jazz to um, explain to people, really, how bats live, how they see the world. And I said, see, on purpose. I know that a lot of people have the misconception that bats can't see. And in fact, there is the, um, there's the saying, as blind as a bat. But that's a misconception. So essentially, bats see with their ears. In fact, bats have really, really big, cute ears. We're going to see some photos um, as I'm talking of these bats and their huge, cute ears. And bats see with their ears by using echolocation. So what is echolocation? The meaning is in the word echolocate. So they're locating through an echo. Now, what is an echo, first of all, um, and what is a sound? So bats use an echo, sound, and their big ears to be able to see what's around them. So the so sound is produced by the movement of air particles. So for example, our vocal cords are vibrating, the air movement comes out of our mouth, and you hear that sound. In fact, um, I, I can demonstrate this by, uh, I have a, a ruler, I'm trying to find my microphone, Hopefully you hear it, but you should hear some sound. And that's simply because the air around the ruler, as I'm you know, flapping it, is vibrating. And that's where sound ca comes from. So it's essentially a wave that moves out. If there is a solid material in front of it, what happens? It moves, it moves, and it gets reflected back. That's the echo. So this is what happens. The bat is um, producing these chirps, these clicks, and let's see how many I can make in a second. Let's see, or maybe five. Bats can make from 160 to 190 clicks per second. Wow. Yes, it's amazing. Lot. It's amazing. So that's how clearly they can see or hear with the, you know, see with their ears. So they're making these clicks. They're com these clicks, these echoes are coming back to their ears, and they're essentially seeing what there is around them. Now you might ask, but how can they find one tiny little mosquito in the middle of a forest? You know, we're going to see that later. We're going to explain that later. But essentially, bats can also um, cancel out background noise. So Ooh. anything that is not important for them to be able to see or to hear, they just block it out. That would be very useful, wouldn't <laughs> it? <laughs> well, and the. Uh way in which we thought of doing this um, musically was to sort of focus upon the little bits of our hearing that are quite similar to um, bats. Now, bats have a massive range and they have amazing ability and they can hear uh, sounds that are very, very, very high and very, very, very low at the same time. Um, and we can't do that. But what we can do is something that bats um, are quite good at, which is focus in on uh, individual sound while there's lots of other interference. So to look at this musically, um, I thought that it would be interesting to try and hide a famous melody in a piece of music, put lots of music around it, and then let's see if we can focus um, in on the sound, uh, on, on the famous bit of music. Now, there's one thing about this is that it helps a lot if you know what you're looking for, um, which is also, I expect, is the same for a bat. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, so in this case, we're going to play it twice. And the first time, we're not going to say what we're looking for, and we're just going to play the music, and then we'll tell you what the tune is, and we'll see if you can hear it. Okay.
So did you? Well, it was, there was something familiar, but no, <laughs> I could not tell what, what, what the melody was. Okay, well, the, uh, uh, well, the melody is uh, Jingle Bells, which is quite apt since it's nearly December. Hopefully it's <laughs> not too soon. Um, and uh, it's played uh, very low down in the double bass, but you have to um, really hear it, partly because we're not actually used to listen to melodies at the very bottom of the range. So um, this time we'll play it again, and we've made it a little bit easier to spot. But also, if you know you're looking for jingle bells, hopefully you'll be able to spot it this time. Wow, isn't that amazing? <laughs> well, I think it really helps when you know the sort of thing that you're, uh, that you're looking for. And when it's obvious, um, then it all just, it, it should come through a little bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, I also think it would, um, it, I could have made it a little bit easier by putting it in the guitar, but that's something which we could learn, <laughs> bit, learn, learn from this time. Well, it's not made easy for the bets, so it should not be easy for us <laughs> as well, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And okay, uh, so tell us a little bit more. How did this collaboration come about? Um, per perhaps um, b before we go into the collaboration and um, how it came about, mm -hmm. um, um, like something else that is interesting about bets is like how, how, how do they actually make, how do they differentiate between different sounds? So let's say that um, a bat is um, targeting a frog. Now frogs make sounds as well, they croak. And that's going to be quite complicated because we've got the croak of the frog and you've got the echo locations of the, uh, of the bat. So you're getting the echoes coming back to the bat's ears, which is becoming a bit complicated. But the great thing here is, as Dikon said, Bats can hear in different ranges. So they hear in low ranges, they hear in high ranges. In fact, the croak of the frog is of a very low range, it's very low frequency. Whereas the echo that the bat is getting back to its ears, it's quite high range, it's high frequency. So now it can differentiate between the sound and the frog, what is actually making that sound. And then go back and eat the frog. <laughs> <laughs> they need to eat. Not the bats in Malta, actually. The bats in Malta do not eat frogs. Just what putting it out there. Sorry? What do they eat? Most of them will eat mosquitoes, um, moths. We're actually, like, um, very soon we're going to understand how they manage to get these moths and mosquitoes as well. <laughs> can you live on mosquitoes? Well, they can. They I can. can't. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, uh, to show this sort of idea um, musically, the idea is that the bats can uh, hear two sounds, a very, a very, very low one and a very, very uh, high one at the same time. Um, and in order to differentiate between them and sort of like hone in on their, on, on their prey, it helps that the sounds are, 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 are further apart in pitch. So in order to show this musically, the idea was that um, we can, is to show how we can do some of the uh, same sort of thing, but it's made more difficult if uh, we listen to two things in the same pitch. So what we did was play um, two melodies at the same time. At the first time we, uh, we play it, we show them at the same pitch, so they're sort of interfering with each other. And then we gradually move them apart until by the end, uh, one melody is played in double bass and one melody is played very high in the violin. And hopefully, as you listen to this piece, um, it should become easier and easier as it goes on to tell the difference between the two melodies. Mm. At what time do I go? 
Interesting, isn't it? So a frog is quite an easy target because it's a sitting target. It's there, it's not moving. But what about, as we mentioned, mosquitoes and moths, for example, which are re flitting around all the time. We actually have a video here that we can, put, uh, we can show you, which shows a bat catching a moth. It's really quite incredible. So you can see it's using its tail to catch that moth. It's so cool. It's really, really cool. Um, so how is this bat able to locate that moving moth over there? It's, let's say, quite simple in the sense that what's happening essentially is, again, the bat is echolocating, so it's sending out this sound. It's getting back that sound as an echo in its ears. And what's happening is, it's seeing that there is constancy. So you know, the trees are not moving, the building is not moving, so it's always getting back the same sound. It's always getting back the same frequency. So it knows that it's not changing the, air, the, the environment around it. But as soon as something flits by, as soon as something actually moves, that makes a different fre frequency. So essentially, that's at, at a lower range. So it is at a lower frequency, and the bat picks that up immediately, because that's a change. As soon as you see a, a change, it picks it up. Once it picks it up, it starts um, transferring it, the um, high frequency sound directed towards that little, little, little change. That then produces um, echoes which are of higher frequency, which the bat can get much more easily. And the rest That's is history for the bot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if there are several things moving at the same time, how do they differentiate between a moth and, I don't know, a mosquito, for example? Oh, that's, a good, that's a very, very good question. Um, Mela, I'm not a bat, so I'm <laughs> this not 100% sure. This is the appetite. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but so a bat will be able to um, differentiate between a moth and a mosquito, mostly because of the size. So the, the difference in the size is going to... Um, is going to give the echo a different frequency. Okay. So the smaller the size, usually in this case, is going to have a lower frequency, so it's going to tell in that way. Um, but the intricate, actually, one of the things that's extremely interesting about bats is that we don't know. We don't know a lot of things. Bats are extremely understudied. So um, we've only recently, for example, discovered, and uh, we'll, we'll keep on going on the um, bats and music, but we've only recently discovered that bats can communicate between each other, and they socially chat. They chat, for example, about um, sharing food. They fight about the spaces <laughs> that they're living in, like, hey, that's my sleeping spot. And they also fight about um, um, unwanted male advances. Oh. Let's put it like that. Yes, <laughs> it's very interesting. Not, so, not very dissimilar to, no, exactly, <laughs> to exactly, the humans exactly. in that sense. Except the mosquitoes again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so bet, back to bats and moving objects. Oh, well, um, I mean, this sort of thing is, is, is something that's really familiar to us, and it's so familiar uh, to us that it's almost, it's become a sort of integral part of most of the music that we listen to, where um, in order to pick out something small and something move, move in the bats, uh, whole can, are able to recognize all of the sounds that remain constant, and then they can focus it upon the sound that's moving. So in music, we can uh, see this as sort of in action because the uh, melody is normally the fastest moving part of a, uh, of a tune, and the uh, harmony or the rhythm normally, although not always, remains quite, quite constant. So in order to uh, show this, I um, put together a very fast melody against a slower moving um, uh, accompaniment, and you can sort of consider the accompaniment to represent something like the uh, trees or the, um, or the objects or the landscape, and the uh, prey is the, uh, is the melody which is played in the violin. Let's see it all together. <laughs>
<laughs> very, very interesting, isn't it? So, if you were the moth, mm -hmm. and um, you know you saw that there is a bat approaching you, would you like? Stick around, just oh flip. no, no, exactly. I would fly <laughs> for <laughs> my life. Exactly, exactly. And actually, moths can do something else. So, obviously, a lot of prey are not going to enjoy the fact that they might be eaten. So they try and defend themselves. There are crickets which are able to hear the echolocation, and when they hear, they just go away. They move away from the sound. There are moths that can camouflage themselves um, audially, essentially. And I'll explain how. So let's take, um, actually, before I explain how, it's, let's, let me make um, a comparison. Think of a chameleon, all right? So a chameleon against a, um, a tree, you know, on the trunk, so against a natural background, you can barely see it because it changes its color. It's camouflaging. But if you change that background and make it, I don't know, red, what's happening? The chameleon cannot become red, cannot change. It will try. It might be able to shift a little bit to a more orangey color, mm -hmm. but it still sticks out. It's camouflage as it's working anymore. So the moths do the same thing with sound. So I'm the bat. The bat is um, issuing these calls, these um, sounds. It's getting back the echo, and essentially, you know, it's doing that, keeping getting back the echo. So tree, tree, tree. Hmm, strange tree. It's getting back the echo now, but there's a little bit of difference in the frequency. So what it does is it changes. The bat changes his frequency. Its frequency. So again. Echo, 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 changing frequency, so it's a higher frequency. So now this is a frequency that the moth cannot emulate. The moth, moth cannot replicate the same sound. Choop, choop, oop, that's a different frequency. That's something else. That must be a moth. That's something that I can go pick and eat. So the camouflage essentially doesn't work anymore because the bat can change the frequency of echoes that it gets back to its ears. So it's like a sound camouflage. Yes. If you like. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes, I wouldn't be a very good moth in these. <laughs> <laughs> these or a chameleon. <laughs> or a chameleon. <laughs> well, the idea of doing this uh, musically was um, that it, it did actually sound when I when I read about this uh, to be quite similar to the sort of thing that we do do in jazz quite a lot, where we play call and response and call and response. But this time, uh, there was the opportunity to make it more interesting by seeing if you could uh, create a sort of chase between a bat and a moth. So uh, in this case, Carl, the guitar, is going to pretend to be a bat briefly, and he <laughs> plays a melody. And Veggie, who plays violin, is going to pretend to be uh, a moth, and he's going to play it back. Um, and hopefully, Reggie is going to imitate what Carl does exactly, and Carl's going to make it more difficult for him, and then Reggie's going to try and um, be clever, and eventually, we think, uh, hopefully, um, Carl uh, wins the race. Would um, the other musician be the tree then? Well, uh, <laughs> I probably, yes, the other musician's me, so I'd probably be in the tree in this case. That makes sense, <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> the one thing that stays, t stays con consistent. So that's it. <laughs>
and the moth was quite worried over there, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I got the feeling that by the end the moth sort of lost it. Yes. <laughs> it didn't know what sounds to make. <laughs> well, our, um, our final piece uh, is to talk more about what it is like to be a bat. And we've talked about how amazing uh, bats are at hearing and how well they can um, tune out other sounds. But uh, amazing though they are, they have uh, limits in terms of quite how much uh, noise they can put up with. And one of the problems that bats deal with is uh, the amount of building work, uh, the amount of road sound, sound the amount of noise um, uh, that they experience as part, produced by humans as part of the everyday uh, uh, life. And they can't tune out everything. So what tends to happen is they keep on moving further and further away from places where people live and their habitats gradually, um, even though there may be lots of places for them to live, um, they can't put up with the noise when they go hunting. Um, so in order to illustrate this, it's quite simple that even though um, we've shown how we can do similar things to the bats in terms of focusing on things on music, even we might find it quite difficult to listen to a jazz band in the middle of uh, traffic. So that's what this one will show. Hmm. Okay, so let's do a little, a little question and answer yeah. um, because I have some curiosities. <laughs> like I said before, how does this collaboration come about? Um, so essentially, they're two remember. very different it's things, bats, <laughs> music. You don't normally put those two together, no, would you? No, 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 no. I think, um, I, from what I remember, correct if I'm wrong, because this has been a while ago now, um, I think, Dikon, you were pitching for, with science, for science in the City um, a few ideas about using music to teach and um, show, raise awareness about, I can't remember what um, topics in science, but I remember I was in this conversation, essentially, and um, you were talking about m music, and I was like, ah, you know, what creature, what species actually really uses sound to survive. Bats, and not just bats, obviously, there's also, you know, dolphins, whales, they also do sonar. But bats are particularly in important, I guess, for um, me and Greenhouse, because we study bats. So that was at the forefront of my mind. So as soon as uh, Deacon started talking about music, I was like, ah, bats and music would be interesting. Mm. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, and, and a lot of funny things happened uh, just after that because uh, as soon as we talked about bats, I started noticing bats <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, a lot more because you sometimes, well, obviously they're very difficult to see about, about when they, because of when they come out. But after mm. that, uh, every time we went for a walk, I would see the bats come out at dusk and uh, we thought they were sort of really quite beautiful. We used to stop and watch them for quite a long time. Yes. That's true. And when they come out at dusk, they're not really, really sort of, they, they hover over um, people very, very closely sometimes. Yes, 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 yes. Actually, um, Deacon has a, a nice story to tell about. Uh, last time I remember you were saying how you've noticed that bats come towards you and then they stop. They're like, oh, but there is something yeah. there. And then they <laughs> flitter they away. away. Um, so th that's essentially, you know, that's them ecolocating, realizing, oh, there's an object there, human. And that is why they sort of sad do sudden, sudden flight changes. They do do sudden mm. flight changes because of that, yes. No, it's, it's quite scary the, uh, because they, 
you can catch an instance of their little face as they just before <laughs> they uh, change direction, but they never hear you. That's They're the cute thing. little face. That's true. And why jazz? Um, well, I play jazz, and actually, to begin with, I uh, uh, I thought that this would be something more like the carnival of the animals, but uh, it came back to jazz partly because of the sort of, the sort of um, well, the sounds seem to almost be closer to what what I felt was a, a bat was like, strangely. And, um, but also some of the things like the call and response and the difference in pitches and the focusing on ideas. These are, these are sort of games that we play anyway mm. in jazz. So, so it seemed natural just to sort of go, go with it. Really. Natural, yeah, mix. Yeah, You've exactly. said that you study bats. Yes. Is it just bats? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> so actually I need, to, I need to point out, I am not the best researcher. Um, in, with a greenhouse, um, Elena Portelli is the best researcher. I just really enjoy doing research with her on bats. Um, but we also study orchids okay. in Malta and Gozo because, for example, in Gozo, we have one orchid species that is only found there. Nowhere else in the world is it found. It's just found in a spot in Gozo. Wow. It's amazing, exactly. How and rare is that? Yeah, ex extremely. We have around 30 different species of orchids in Malta. We also have some species of bats in Malta. We're going to show some, um, some images of them. Yeah, some cute images. Mm. So we made these because we wanted to kind of um, bring them back to you know, a fun place. So these are the bats that you find in Malta. So we, g we gave them like a bit of character. Uh, we also study bees. Actually, we study solitary okay. bees. So bees that don't make honey, but are extremely important for pollination. Yeah, there's a variety. How interesting is that? We have some audience questions. Uh, why do we refer to bats resonating with its environment as seeing rather than hearing? Okay, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Uh, I think it's a bit of a philosophical answer, to, to be honest, <laughs> the one that I'm going to give, though. Um, because I mean, when we, he all right, when we perceive, you know, what we perceive as hearing, Okay, let's bring it back actually. So when we hear, we don't, when I hear at least, let's bring it back to me. When I hear, I don't see. If, if, if I hear, I don't know, if I hear something drop, I don't see it drop. I cannot make a visual image of what I'm hearing. However, for example, blind people can if they practice to be honest, we all can, but we need to practice a lot. So it's an ability you gain. It's, it's an ability you gain. So what they do is um, they click with their tongue. I cannot do it, so I cannot show it. But they essentially click and, yeah, click. I can do that. Hallelujah. Thank God. Um, so they click and somehow they hear the echo coming back to them as well. So for example, they click and they hear the echo and by hearing the echo, they can tell how far away an object is. And this allows people who, um, you know, so, like who uh, in society we say cannot see to actually bike on, um, on a trail, to walk with just a stick and nothing else. It's amazing. So yes, I think disability is much more than hearing, it is seeing essentially so mostly instead of seeing maybe we can say visualizing rather yes. than so, so it's, yes. it puts a picture yes, in your yes, mind yes. rather than seeing the way we normally yes. refer to it with our eyes actually the thing the, the the phrase i like to use but it's not the correct phrase it's something i made up but um i like to say they audially visualize so okay. they use the audio to visualize um yeah so it's not exactly exactly seeing that's true but it's still making a, a visual imagery of the area around them. Okay, how about bats in Malta? Tell us a little bit more about them. So bats in Malta. Um, so actually, um, okay. So what's interesting is, um, as Nico mentioned, you know, bats are greatly affected, unfortunately, by urban development. They're greatly affected by humans, by what we, we're doing in, in the environment. So for example, they're greatly affected by light, light at night, light pollution. In fact, for example, in Cittadella, I think I should mention it because it's a really, like, it's an applaudable initiative. In Cittadella, they've used light on purpose 
to not affect and to not impact negatively bats. So wow. they they changed their lighting to make sure that's and that's uh, um, that's thanks to EcoGozo actually, and which is a great initiative. And I think it should be happening everywhere around Malta and Gozo. Um, so for example, I mean, bats, um, insects are attracted to light. And if you go, for example, on a football field at night and you'll see a spotlight, mm -hmm. you'll see a lot of mosquitoes and moths going around these floodlights and bats flitting and coming in contact and, you know, it's a, essentially a buffet hmm. for them. But uh, so you might say, ah, oh, but isn't that good? Isn't that positive for the bats? It is for some, but it's not for all. So there are some bats which, yes, they actually have managed to adapt and make use of you know, this pollution, this light pollution, but some of them haven't managed. So I think we need to be conscientious of all of them, really. Okay, last question. Do we have a large population of bats in Malta? Ah, uh, that's difficult. <laughs> um, it depends. We do have, we, we do have some uh, quite we do have some bats which are, in quite, which are quite um, well populated, let's put it like that. But um, they're also very densely populated in certain areas of Malta. So look, like for example, you do find less obviously in urban areas. Mm -hmm. But there are um, quite a lot of bat, other bat species in Malta as well, which they're not doing so well, so which are not so great populated. But we're still discovering, so we're still discovering that there are some subspecies in Malta like last year we discovered there's a new subspecies in Malta that we didn't even know existed. So it's difficult to answer because there's so much yet to learn. That's but true. we keep on working to be able to answer these questions. Thank you so much, Simone. Thank you, Dickin. That you. was very, very interesting. I've learned a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> so now we are going to go on a short break and we'll be...